Well, thank you all for being here today. And I wanna thank also our virtual attendees. We have some people with us on Zoom as well. And I do wanna just start by reminding everybody that today's event is being recorded and it's also being live streamed. And just a quick reminder to our in-person audience, this room with its microphones in the ceiling, wherever they are, um, picks up a lot of ambient noise. So if you think you're having a nice little side conversation with somebody, it's probably being broadcast on Zoom. <laughs> so just be aware of that. Um, as many of you know, though, today's event is the second in a series of offerings about Cambodia that the, kit, that the Cohen Center is putting on this spring. And all of these are leading up to our 2024 Genocide Awareness Lecture on April 3rd, which is featuring Luang Ng. Luang is a survivor of the Cambodian genocide who went on to become a human rights activist and a best-selling author. And registration for that event is currently open. So if you haven't already reserved a seat, we would recommend that you do that soon. You'll see these posters with ordinary citizens, extraordinary lives peppered all around campus. Um, you can find more information about how to register there. The Cohen Center is offering many events about Cambodia in the spring in hopes that it will open up deeper conversation in our community about both the Cambodian genocide and also Cambodian life and culture today. So last night we hosted a film screening of the film First They Killed My Father at Keene Public Library. And at 2 p.m. today, we're also honored to be hosting a gallery talk with photographer Eleanor Briggs. Eleanor, where are you? You're with us. Right in the front. <laughs> so at 2 p.m., you can chat with this amazing, talented photographer about the exhibit that we have on display, which is entitled Cambodia Then and Now. So we hope that some of you will be able to stay on for that. And additionally, on April 17th, we're co-hosting a virtual workshop for educators in partnership with Keene University in New Jersey. And that workshop is called Teaching the Cambodian Genocide Through Testimony. So information about all of these events is available on our website and our public calendar. But to bring us back to the present moment, I wanna say how absolutely honored we are to be hosting Bodhi Barton for this Cohen conversation today. Um, it was originally entitled Reflections on the Killing Fields and recently retitled A Place Where Ice Falls from the Sky. And in just a moment, Rodney Obian, who's our college archivist and associate professor here at Dean St. College, will introduce Bodhi. And after Rodney's introduction, Bodhi is going to offer a presentation of about 40 minutes. So with whatever time we might have remi remaining after that, he'll be able to hopefully take a few questions from our audience. And then at 1.30, we're going to have to formally end our event because there's actually a class coming in to use the space. <laughs> but we're encouraging everyone to continue the conversation downstairs with us in the lobby. And if you're able to also stay for our gallery talk this afternoon. And lastly, just a couple words of thanks before we get started. Um, first to Michelle Kiawa, who I think is still doing things out in the hallway to make sure things are running smoothly today. <laughs> Uh, but she arranged all of the logistics and the catering for today's event that many of you in person are enjoying. Um, I also want to thank the TV Barton right in the front row here, the Bonnie's daughter and one of our talented undergraduate students here at Keene State College, who designed all of the flyers and the social media graphics for today's event. And just looking at these, I'm sure you've all seen that her talent in graphic art is tremendous. So thank you so much for TV. Um, Rodney also did the bulk of the behind the scenes work to make today's event a reality, and the center in general really values our partnership with Keene State College Archives and with Mason Library. And lastly, as I said before, just a huge thanks to you, Bodhi, for trusting our community and for being willing to be here with us today. And lastly, thanks to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making time for important conversations like these and to hear firsthand accounts and you know, stories of witness of what, what the past has held. So I'm going to turn things over to Rodney. He's going to introduce Bodhi. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Bodhi. Thank you, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm again, Rodney Ovian. I'm head of special collections uh, and archives here at Mason Library. I also have the uh, privilege of overseeing the Holocaust and Genocide Studies collection, which many of our students um, use quite, quite a bit. Um, I have also the honor of uh, introducing Bodhi, Bodhi Barton, our guest speaker, and I have to thank the TV. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but the TV for um, making the initial uh, 
introduction to your father. Um, so I learned from the TV that uh, Bodhi was a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. And just out of curiosity, you know, I reached out to him. And maybe it was the time we were at the 99 restaurant in Brattleboro. I guess we met there quickly. And so we just had this conversation. Jessica, his wife, was with us. And I, I just asked him, has anyone ever archived your story? And you said, no. And then I asked you, have you ever shared your story? And he said, no. <laughs> and I, then I asked, would you like to share your story? And that was an emphatic yes. <laughs> you, you, you see why. This, um, but, um, and so I went and I talked to Dr. Bodhi <laughs> Kate um, and asked if we could um, have Bodhi share his story as part of the Cohen conversations. And she said, without hesitation, yes. And so we, here we are today. Um, and thank you, Kate. Thank you, Michelle, for making this happen. So leading up to today, um, Bodhi and I had had several conversations, and he's um, he shared this, his story with me. And I, I can say that story is very compelling, certainly very heart wrenching, but in true Bodhi style, it's very hopeful. So um, I hope, and I'm sure you'll feel the same. Um, it is worth mentioning that. Bodhi is a proud member of the class of 1997. Can I get your class right? Okay. Yes. Um, with, uh, graduating with a BA in psychology. He is currently the director of Gaining Ground, a program of the Parent Child Center of Rutland County, Vermont. And um, you're living in Dan, Dan? Yes. Danby. 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 So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bodhi, but I also want to say welcome to the Cohen Center. And welcome back to Keene State College. It's extremely emotional for me, so be patient. It's all I can ask. But Kim, so welcome. Welcome. Kim. Today, I am grateful and thankful. For King State College and the Genocide Center, because King State College and the Genocide Center provide a platform for me where I can heal. So today is a big healing for me. <laughs> and I'm sure you can understand if you have any relatives, anybody who survived an atrocity, you know what that's like. So I'm going to begin. My talk is called A Place Where I Swell From the Sky. A story of a boy who has faced humanity's worst, the killing fields. And good afternoon. I want to start offering you this image, this vision. Okay. As a child in an orphanage near the border between Thailand and Cambodia, I dreamt of a place, a place where ice fell from the sky a place where life, a place where hope transcends despair, a place where life is pure joy. Keep that image in mind as I tell my story. It will. I will come back to it later. Perhaps Frederick Nietzsche said it best, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you live a fulfilling life a life full of meaning, a life full of purpose, a powerful existence that's driven by passion. A life that says, I've been granted a second chance. Hello, and am Jim My name is Bodhi New Barton. My purpose today is to share with you the fight for my life, surviving the killing fields. On September 9, 1970, I think, I believe, I was granted a life, a life of peace, a life of harmony, a life of exceptional bliss. I have the privilege of living with my mother and father. At the age of five, at the age of five, I am the fifth of six children. I have one sister and four brothers. My mother was a merchant and my father was a doctor. 
My mother managed a merchant store near the city of Phnom Penh, and my father was a doctor. We had two houses, one near the city of Phnom Penh and one in the countryside. My older brother was my caretaker. With them, I enjoy such events as riding water buffalo, plowing the rice field, and collecting fighting fish, slimy fighting fish. My favorite memories of my brother was doing the amazing, fun, torrential downpour. I remember slipping and sliding and having such an amazing time with them. My sister also took care of me. The fondest memory of my sister was going to the market and feasting on the food there. I would taste such entree as papaya salad, jasmine rice, and beef ban mai. That is a little influence from the Vietnamese, but it was still very good. One of my favorite memory, um, sorry. My sister was an incredible cook. Even now, when I, when I remember, when I taste a certain food, I remember some of the food she's cooked. I can still recall my family having dinner together. It was all amazing. My recollection of my parents were not very much. They spent most of their time my mother working on her business, and my father working in the city. Fortunately, she, my mother had a sister, um, her aunt. I mean, unfortunately, my mother had a sister. And I remember playing with my cousins at my aunt's house. The fondest memory I have of my family before the destruction of Cambodia was when my parents invited Buddhist monks to bless us. I remember my sisters and my mother would spend all days cooking and preparing for the ritual. All of us was blessed. So after the blessing, myself, my older brother, my younger sister, my parents, my father's parents and my mother, we all stayed at the merchant's house while my father went to work at the city my two older brother and my sister went to the countryside. Little did I know this would be the last time I would see my father and my sister. Welcome, Nate. And this is like, these are my two dearest friends. I grew up with both of them. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to focus on this story. <laughs> the next morning, I woke, I woke to machine gun fire, grenade explosion, animal running frantically on the loose, smoke everywhere from car being set on fire. All I could see was men dressed in black shooting at us, screaming, wafting ah. <laughs> which translates to die all, die all. The, the next second, my mother grabbed my arm and we exited through the back door. We ran, we ran as fast as we could away from the gunfire. I remember my mother saying, we should run up our family, but how? My father was at the hospital. My sister and my older brother at our main house hours away. All we had time for was to take care of the people with us. As we ran, I remember witnessing children crying hysterically and pulling at their dead parents' body, screaming at them to move. I remember people running as fast as they could in all directions. People were screaming, screaming out to their family. The apocalyptic day become an apocalyptic night. Corps of children, adults, elderly, littered the street as we continued to run for our lives. The gunfire occasionally stopped um, Stop doing the ensuing long day and night. Everyone would rest where they could with the remaining family members. I can't remember how long my I can't remember how my mother got us food, but she did. We also foraged as we went from place to place to stay alive. We ate grasshopper, red firing ants, scorpions, mango, 
tamarind, tarantula, snake, and all kinds of different fish. We slept in fields or woods on the side of the road, wherever we could find safe place to rest our exhausted body. We drank water from the river when we were blessed to come upon one. After what seemed like forever, the war ended. Our family, myself, my mother, my brother, and my grandparents settled down somewhere in the some in a small town somewhere in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge soldiers started to, to show up. The soldier told us that they had won the war and they are now rebuilding the country stronger and better. Right away, they told us that it is important work for doctors, lawyers, professors, teachers, and politicians, and they would be paid. They instructed these professional, politician, and intellectual to meet at a specific time and place to receive their job assignments. I discovered later, those who met up were tied up and marched to the killing field and they were executed. Little by little, the Khmer Rouge began an even more horrific range of terror. First, they told us everyone must work hard to rebuild our country. We must work in the field no matter our age or gender. My baby brother, my grandparents, my older brother, and my mother all had different jobs. My mother and grandparents planted rice in the rice paddy. My older brother plowed fields where corn was later grown. My baby brother and I had to collect sticks and pull weed from the field. The stick were used to make fire to boil gallons and gallons of water with a teaspoon of rice in it. We were told that any crop that we produced were not to be eaten. All meals were served in a community setting and eat together. No one was allowed to forage, grow their own food, or steal. If caught, we would be tortured or executed. Every day, we would walk miles to find sticks in 100 degrees heat. The sun beat down upon us. My baby brother, with his small body, was just three years of age. And his body shut down from nourishment and abuse. He dies of starvation. My grandparents died too long not after. Baby brother from malnourishment and starvation. I remember watching my mother comforting them to stay alive. Seeing my baby brother and my grandparents die was so horrific and devastating. There was nothing I could do for them. I was also suffering from malnourishment and starvation. The Khmer Rouge soldier came by and informed us that all family were no longer allowed to stay together, so we can better concentrate on, the, on our work. <laughs> they told us that corn and rice production has to be produced at a much, much faster rate. I remember being taken through a huge shed-like structure where thousands of kids were crammed together. The shed, was, the shed had no ventilation. We stepped on the floor. The living conditions were harsh and inhumane. There was two Khmer Rouge child soldiers, armed and dressed in black, who watched our shed. Each day, we, each day we were fed a huge bowl of rice, of water with a grain of rice in it. I suffered from mal malnourishment. My body reduced to no more than a skeleton. I had difficulty getting up in the morning because my body was so weak. I stumbled and struggled to walk. I was so hungry, I decided I would eat whatever I could, and I didn't care if I was shot or tortured. I didn't want to die like my brother and my grandparents. When we were doing our daily stick collecting, I ate lives, grasshoppers, mangoes, tree barks, while the soldier was occupying with something else that they were doing. Each night, I would go to bed crying, hungry, afraid, wishing my mother and my brother would rescue me. My starvation was so bad that all I wanted to do was to die in my sleep. Each day, I dreaded walking into the scorching 100 degrees to collect sticks. Each day was getting harder and harder, and I had to walk further and further to find them. All I saw in the forest and the rice paddy were the human remains decomposing. The smell of rotten flesh didn't register because I was so malnourished that my senses couldn't grasp the severity of what surrounded me. The field, as far as I could see, was littered with human skulls, bones, flies, and decomposing body but all I care was to find something to eat. One night in the dark, my older brother showed up at my shed. He brought corn he had grown. I don't know how he found me, but he did. He gave me the corn, but the Khmer Rouge caught him. The child soldier placed the corn cob across his, his open mouth. They tied the corn to his mouth with this scarf so tightly he couldn't move, he couldn't move his jaw. The soldier tied his hand behind his back and marched him to the killing field, where they would beat him with their guns. My brother fell to the ground in excruciating pain. 
He struggled to stand up as blood dripped from his nose, mouth, and ears. The soldier beat him again and again and again as he tried to stand up. When my brother couldn't stand up anymore, the soldier stomped on his head and kicked and smashed him with their guns. They taught the river by saying, eat, die, eat, die, which translates to see up, see up. My apologies. It's very emotional for me. As they tortured my brother, my brother laid on the ground, lifeless as the Khmeru soldier continued to beat him. My brother managed to survive the first beating, and without hesitation, he continued to steal food from me to keep me alive. He was beaten, tortured many more times as a result. I thought one of those times the soldier would execute him. The child soldier were no more, no older than me. It was only a game to them to torture my brother. One night out of nowhere, my brother and my mother showed up at my shed, and he, they told me that the Khmer Rouge has been defeated. We were free. It was the happiest day of my existence. I couldn't believe my brother, my mother, was here. It didn't seem real. I thought either I was dead or dreaming. My, my, my mother and my brother brought amazing food, fruit, rice, and fish with them. We ate quietly. We ate our food quietly. I remember speaking. I don't remember speaking much. Simply being around them was enough for me. We wandered for a while around Cambodia from town to town. We looked for my sister, my father, and my brothers, but couldn't find them. We saw Vietnamese soldiers and just kept on walking. The soldiers didn't appear to want to har harm, hurt us, but they, as the Khmerus did. I wanted to thank them, but I was still afraid anyone with guns or driving tanks. Our wandering brought us to a village near the Thai border where we stayed for about a year. Here I witnessed rice being used as a form of money. You could buy anything you wanted with rice. The biggest demand was red meat. Trapper who caught huge rice rat that earns him a lot of money. I could still remember the grilled rice shish, uh, rat shish kebab, flavor of the lem lemongrass. They tasted so good with jasmine rice and papaya salad. In this village, I also witnessed cow being butchered for meat. The whole village marched a cow to the forest there were men with machetes that started hacking the cow. When it, fi when it finally died, everyone rushed with buckets and containers to collect bloods, the cheapest part of the cows. We got lots of cow blood. I wasn't particularly fond of cow's blood, but I ate it to stay alive. Little by little, rumor of little by little, rumors started to circulate that the Vietnamese soldier were brutalizing and murdering people. The soldier would gun down Cambodian arbitrary without reason. Anyone caught leaving Cambodia would also be gunned down. In this village, there was always talk about Cambodia being shot while trying to escape across the Thai border. The Vietnamese soldier guarded the border that was litter and landmine. Many Cambodians didn't dare cross the border for the fear of their lives, and those who did, few survived. My mother told my brother and me that Cambodia is no longer a safe place. She said if we stayed here, another killing bill would happen. My mother spoke to a villager who took Cambodian to Thai, to Thai border town. She was warned that it would be expensive and also extremely dangerous. Young children often die trying to cross the Thai border. From our village, the Thai border was about two weeks walk nonstop. I wasn't sure how, how my mother paid the villager who guided us to the Thai border town, but according to my brother, she paid, one, she paid him with one of her golden bracelet, which she had managed to save from the Khmer Rouge to hide from the Khmer Rouge. We started our journey to the Thai border, going from village to village, eating whatever we caught or forage. I remember the heat was so intense. In the rice paddy, there were, there were fish that went, got, uh, gone belly up. We picked up the one that were fresh and ate them, leaving rotten one. The fish were small and good to, for soup or stew. My favorite thing to eat were grasshopper and their eggs. Tarantula was especially as tarantula, especially with the abdomen and scorpions. I can't recall all the things that happened through our long walk, but I do remember my brother carrying me most of the way. We finally came to a village that bordered Thailand. There we saw lots of Vietnamese with machine guns. They appear threatening. Their demeanor says, you'll be shot if you try to cross. Most Cambodians stay away from the border. Each night, we fear our lives, too scared to sleep. Sporadic fighting would erupt with little notice. One evening, we were preparing a meal when 
an RPG rocket whizzed by us. We abandoned our food and ran for our lives. The RPG landed perhaps 200 feet away. All we saw were body parts flying through the air. This village reminded us of the killing field happening all over again. Cambodians were murdered here on a daily basis. My mother told us we would die if we stay. Our choice was to risk crossing the Thai border or return to our old village where we would face certain death. My mother decided she would use the last of her jewelry, a pair of pure gold earrings, to get us over to the Thai border. We joined a group of Cambodians who also decided to risk crossing the Thai border. In our group, there were Cambodian trail guides. My brother told me this guy knew the routine of Vietnamese soldiers guarding the border. He knew the time that the Vietnamese would take dinner break. He knew which route was heavily uh, was not heavily guarded, and he knew which one was not uh, landminded. My mother began showing a sign of sickness with the onset of diarrhea, the day of the tighter border crossing. My mother's health worsened. The group met, the group met our guy quietly and secretly. I'm not sure how many there were in our group, but there was a lot of there was a lot of Cambodian. The guy told us we must run across the border at midnight. And once we were on the trail, absolutely no noise or flashlight. The Vietnamese soldier would start shooting if they saw a flashlight or anyone crossing. We went across the border in complete darkness. I remember children and adults being trampled as we crossed the border. My brother carried me while my mother led us. We crossed the border. We crossed before I knew it. We made it across alive. I'm not sure when we made it to our first camp just outside of Cambodia. My mother collapsed as we reached the camp. She seemed lifeless as the relief worker tried giving her water. She was breathing, but her pulse was very weak. The relief worker placed my mother on a stretcher and carried her to a tent. My brother and I followed right behind, hungry, exhausted, and scared. In front of us, there were many tents. I remember the Red Cross sign. A woman, white skin, blue eyes, spoke in a strange language, examined my mother. They laid my mother on a bed with an ivy set on her arm. They gave us water and food to eat. Each day, a nurse came to give my mother her medicine. My mother's diary was so severe that she was bedridden. The medicine received didn't seem to help her. Her health deteriorated day by day. My brother and I tried to comfort our dying mother. She was so sick that she couldn't speak. She coughed a lot and struggled to stay alive. My brother and I would get up each early morning to wash our mother and try to feed her. She ate, but the food, the food would pass through her. It seemed like week or perhaps month went by. The Red Cross took care of us. We were safe. We had food and roof over our heads. However, each day we would see a truck coming into the camp, picking up Cambodians and taking them somewhere. My brother told me that the truck were going back to Cambodia. He also told me that the Thai hated us. They wanted us out of their country. There were four sentry posts around the perimeter of the camp. Each post was guarded by the Thai soldier. There were, there were stories about Cambodians being shot while trying to escape the camp. This is perhaps the saddest part of my existence thus far. I will never forget the day I woke up and I woke up and found my mother who had just passed. When we went to bathe her, my mother's body was cold and stiff without any response. She had passed away during the night. I felt cheated and abandoned. I never even get to say goodbye to my mother. As the relief worker lifted my lifeless mother onto a stretcher, I didn't want to let her go. I held on to her lifeless body, her hands as hard as I could. The worker had to pull me away from my mother. I remember feeling so all alone in this awful, scary world. Our mother was the only thing we had left. Now that she had passed, we would be go? Who would take us? We had nobody. We had no relative and no one to go to. For the first time in my life, I felt afraid, even more than doing the killing field. For the first time, I felt as if this world was an awful place to be alive. There seemed nothing to live for. I wanted to die with my mother. I wanted to die so I can be with her. I remember thinking about how to little kid in this world of hatred, sickness, destruction, loss and killing could survive. I had no will to live. I wanted, I wanted to die. I cried so hard. My heart, soul, and spirit were broken. Now that my mother had passed, 
people would be at this day, the Red Cross. The Red Cross, the Red Cross was our protection. It was our survival. Now we would have to live with the other refugees. I turned to my brother and I said, where will we go? I looked at my brother. I could tell by his face that he was just as devastated as I was. It was just too much destruction. It was at this time the nurse who was taking care of my mother approached us with the Cambodian interpreter. And she said, I would love to adopt you both, but I'm committed to stay here in this camp to take care of the sick. However, there is an orphanage in this camp where you both can go. My spirit lifted a little. I couldn't believe there was a, an orphanage in this refugee camp. We waved goodbye to our nurse friend as the gate to the orphanage opened. We were led into a huge warehouse like tent. There were many cots set up. We were informed that this is where we, we will be sleeping. The orphanage had a fence all around it. There was Cambodian worker. There was Cambodian worker and a tall, blonde, blue eyes, white skinned worker who spoke strange language. Also, there were tall, black skinned, black hair worker who spoke strange language. There was a zoo chaka field where orphans could play. Soccer was introduced to me and I loved it. My brother and I played soccer with the other orphans from dawn to dusk. I remember feeling safe because I didn't have to worry about anybody trying to kill us. We didn't have to worry about starvation. Food was being given to us every day. Everyone here had to take a shower each week. My brother and I made friends easily and quickly with others. But still, I miss my mother terribly. I often wonder if she was cremated or got buried properly or was discarded amongst other Cambodians who had died here. One night after dinner, we were told that we would be moved to another camp. I thought the worker was lying to us. I thought we were going to be taken back to Cambodia. I couldn't sleep, and the next morning I couldn't eat because I knew we were being taken back to Cambodia. My brother and I, we, my brother and I would suffer and eventually died. Two buses arrived to pick us up. Everyone was quiet with their face down. I could tell everyone was scared of the uncertainty. The Cambodian worker came with us while the American worker stayed behind. We drove what seemed like forever until we reached a camp. The camp had actual building, no tents in sight. There were 10 small dorms in this orphanage. Each dorm had a community bathroom and a dining common. Each dorm was assigned a Cambodian worker, female for the girls and male for the boys. There was a huge water tank for everyone to use for showering and drinking. However, we could only take shower once a week because were, water was rationed. I was so happy when it rained because I could take shower freely and I, didn't, I could drink as much as water as I wanted. We were required to go to school in this camp. I remember thinking, wow, free education and teaching and teacher teach us reading, writing, and math. Every day I was excited to go to school and learn. Although I especially love reading, my favorite thing was writing. This camp was amazing. We had free schooling. We didn't see any watchtower. We didn't see any Thai soldier. No, no gunshots or killing. We were, we were clothed and food was plentiful here. Every day I played with the other orphans. We played rubber band shoots, hit bamboo sticks and threw coins into the hole. Everyone was happy. There was so, ha there was so much happiness in this orphanage. There was actually romance between a boy and a girl who later got married. I remember attending the wedding ceremony and got really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it taught me a lesson to never drink again. <laughs> I'm not sure how long we stayed in this camp, but judging my, my, refugee, my refugees photos,
I'm not sure how long I stayed in this camp, but judging by my refugees' photos, I say until 1982, about a year and a half. Kids were always talking about America. The photo here. about a year and a half, because we're always talking about America. I remember the amazing story about orphans brought to America. They said, there's a place where ice fall out of the sky. At first, I didn't believe it. I said to myself, this place is not real. There is no way ice would fall out of the sky naturally. Because if you think about it in Cambodia, it is 100 degrees there. And to cool yourself, you have to purchase you have to spend a lot of money to buy ice and so on. They said American were tall, had blonde hair, light skin, and funny noses. When the American workers spoke, it sounds strange, like lots of wind and sounds coming within the mouth. I've seen American in the first camp after crossing the border. One day I saw an American worker coming to our orphanage to sign orphan orphanage to sign orphans who wants to go to America. I said to myself that those who live in America must live in an amazing place and country. We're definitely a superior race. Our friends told us that we simply have to sign up to be sponsored to America. My brother and I talk about coming to America. Many of our friends left before us. We began dreaming of a place where ice fall from the sky. Our friends said in order to be sponsored, we must have no living relatives anywhere. Although some of our family might be alive somewhere, we wanted to go to America. We decided to say, we decided to tell the worker there that we have no living relatives. We knew we would be interviewed together and separately and that our answer had to match. We practiced and practiced. We told ourselves that going to America is only a dream. After all, who would want to sponsor two little kids? We decided to sign up anyway. Month has passed, living in this camp was safe and secure. Going to school was my favorite pastime. Learning to read, write, and do math was truly amazing. We assumed we would live in this camp indefinitely since many of our friends had long since sponsored. Then one day, my brother and I were called to meet an American and a company worker. They told us we had a sponsor. I couldn't believe it. Was this real? Was I going to a place where ice fall from the sky? First, they told us they took out a map and showed us where our sponsor lived. Then they told us their name, but I was so excited, I, can't, I, I don't remember. Everything happened so fast from this point forward. And before I knew it, my brother and I were boarding the plane in Thailand. My plane ride was the worst time for me. It seemed like weeks I spent flying the plane. My head hurt, my head hurt. I threw up a lot, and I couldn't sleep and ate very little. There were four kids in our group. None of us speak English. We went from plane to plane and somehow made it to New York. We were at the New York airport for what seemed like forever. I was scared. I thought for certain that we have gotten lost and gotten the wrong plane. Finally, we went outside to the tarmac and boarded a small propeller plane. We were, long, we were not long in the air before we landed in a small airport in Manchester. It was so cold and the wind blew as we stepped off the plane. We walked into the airport and were greeted by our sponsor, an American family of two adults and two children. Our sponsor grabbed our small bag and we walked to their car. On the ride home, I was mesmerized by the light everywhere and the 18 wheelers passing us. My adopted <laughs> sister offered us Dunkin' Donut and I ate and ate until my belly was full. <laughs> it was pitch black when we arrived at our sponsor's house. The dog started to bark. The house was so huge. We were shown to our room in the huge house. We found two bunk beds, dresser, a radio, a closet, and bookshelf. We didn't sleep at all that night. A light stayed on throughout the night. I was uncertain and scared about this culture. The next morning, my adopted mother cooked us an amazing breakfast of jasmine rice and a hefty portion of chicken thighs. After eating, I looked outside and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw ice falling from the sky. My first profile was spectacular. I ran outside and looked up at the sky and thanked the universe. It was as if I'd just been reborn again into this amazing world. As I stood outside, my face toward the sky, my arms stretched out 
to a glistening snowflake, I felt as if being blessed. My adopted sister came after me and giggled and laughed at my wonderment and excitement. She stuck her tongue out and the snowflake landed on her tongue. I did the same. Each snowflake gave my tongue a tingling sensation. I remember saying to myself that this place where ice fall from the sky is real. And I am here. Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan Chiran. That is the end of my story. So just a little bit of explanation on the slide. Um, so if you look at here, you will see the first camp and then the second camp. And this is the pretty much, as you can see, it's a map of Cambodia. And um, again, having a small child, names and years and all those are insignificant when you are trying to fight for your life. You just have to stay alive. So this is just from memories, talking to my brother, people who went to the, to the camp. This is our first camp here. Um, if you look at the picture here, I love this picture because it tells a lot of story. But if you look at me here, you know, I always go, my mind always go back saying nobody. I was a nobody here. <laughs> All right. Well, does anyone have any questions? I will try my best to answer. Yes, Anne. Did you ever find out what happened to your dad? No, I, I sometimes think about that because he was a doctor and I don't know if he actually, um, you know, admitted that he was a doctor and he would have been executed if he admitted that. Yes. So tell us a little bit more about your childhood here. I assume you were in Vermont. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, my acculturates in these amazing cultures have many stories. Um, and uh, for those of you guys are on the Zoom, Amherst, New Hampshire is where I stayed. And uh, soccer, uh, as I told you guys here, I continued that love and through soccer, I actually learned English. To birthday parties in soccer, I actually picked up the language rather quickly. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see. Gosh, it's just so many story. Um, okay, so one of the thing about living with the Bartons, I thought plumbing was disgusting because we had an outhouse in Cambodia. I couldn't get used to that. Um, the fact that we, you wear your shoes, that was another point that was just like, oh, you know, because we have flip flop, we go bare feet. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I just remember having so many good times, parties. I would say the significant of that all was it was healing for me. You know, I had so much uh, chaos in my life. Being reborn in these cultures, it was all I could do. I didn't think much about that. I did think a lot about my mother, but for the most part. I didn't have, I, I just felt like I was robbed doing my childhood as a child. So when I got here, I just immersed in these cultures and just, oh my gosh, I, I can't, that'll be part two, the acculturation part of it. But the people in Amherst, I don't know if anybody's tuning in right now, you know what I'm talking about. All right, <laughs> I don't know what else to say, yes. How did the Bartons find you and your brother in Cambodia? Was there an organization that matched you with them? Yes. There was actually, I think it was a Lutheran church in Manchester that sponsored us. Um, we were not originally, we were just, the Barton was going to be our temporary um, uh, safekeeping. There was actually, um, according to my father, there was actually a lot of politics and a lot of 
uh, we were going to be sent back to Cambodia, what they told me. Because I was only just supposed to stay with them for a certain period of time. And any kids that was here was going to send back to Cambodia. And I remember my, my father, my mother told me that there was people harassing him on a daily basis. They're just keeping, you know, like it's almost like an espionage kind of thing. It was it was really strange. Um, so the question to answer your question, I really don't know how they those are the things that, you know, sometime I would have with my with the the conversation that would happen with my parents. Cause yeah, I wonder that too sometimes. It's like of all the children that were sponsored, why did they pick us? Yes. When you went back to Cambodia, did you successfully trace any of your extended family? At this point, I would have to say that I'm not at that stage yet where I do want to go back because I still are going through this healing process for me. I will perhaps someday go back to Cambodia and I would love to do that so that I can see, you know, maybe where I'm where I come from and all this other stuff. But I haven't made that journey yet. This right here is I believe it's part of my journey. I will take that next step where I would go back to Cambodia. So the answer to your question, I haven't gone back yet. <laughs> yes, um, go ahead. Um, thank you. It's very brave to tell that story. Um, you're telling the story and, and it's healing and it's sharing why we should get more involved as, as citizens of this country. Um, have have you had any experiences with someone that you've told the story to that it's really helped them out, that it's made a difference? Yes. When I first graduated from here, I actually went to Lowell, Massachusetts, and I am very fortunate where I don't have to take medicine. And, and again, I'm not trying to, anyone who's going through the trauma will do what they can, you know, even taking heavy medica medication to stabilize their lives. But I believe that when I was working in Lowell, I've helped many of my um, my culture to overcome schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress, and so on and so forth. Um, I would I, I, I did some teaching, you know, and be empathetic toward them. You know, to say, look, I, I went through it too. Let's let's, you know, we, we would have a certain group. I have the Cambodian group where I had the whole community of Lowell come together and we we would have these groups to support each other. Yes. Where's your brother now? I'm glad you asked that. He is prosper. Um, he he's he's very prosperous right now. He is a mechanic in Low Massachusetts. He's got two young three three children, and he's married and he has a wife. Um, but uh, him and I, that's another thing too. When we came here, a lot has changed too because he soaked more in my culture than I did. So we had a tougher time going through the culture. But you know he's doing really quite well. He's in Low Massachusetts. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. How old were you and your brother when you came to Thailand? That's a very good question. Okay, so um, when I got here, my adopt my my father, my adopted father, took us to the hospital and he took a picture of our risk. And I, I'm not a doctor, but I don't know if anybody here is. He looked at a bone and said that you were not born in 1970, you were born in 1975 because from the malnourished and all this other stuff. So now I have two birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> I have one from 1970, as I said, and, and I told you guys that, you know, I believe and I think it is because of my memories of it. And then I went, you know, the July 10th, 1975, that's a birthday that I use here. So legally I'm born in 19, 1970, but I go by the 1975. Go ahead. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for sharing your story with us. If you're comfortable, I would love if you would tell us a little bit about um, for people who choose to engage in this work, who work with um, child refugees, what would you want them to know um, to be more helpful in that healing journey for children? I would say for them um, who has gone through this atrocity, would tell them to get together with people who's gone through the same thing. So because I believe that pain is shared, okay? Because mm -hmm. when we pair, when we share that, it makes everything a little easier. And a prime example is to be here today, okay? 
I feel like, you know, you guys and my same frequency as me. And it just feels safe. It just feels uh, love. It just feels healed. It's 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 an, an extraordinary uh, a feeling of healness, if you will. I don't know what other word to you, but they just you don't want to pretend it didn't happen, but you also don't want to lock it inside you. It's almost like you know, it's like you got a wound and you got to bled uh, bled it out so that you can heal. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, and that's why you're seeing the tears in my eyes coming out because I am healing. I am releasing that pressure, okay? Um, so thank you for asking that question. Anyone else? Yes. I assume that you saw the film that many of us saw last night, First They Killed My Father. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that was a good depiction of what happened under the Khmer Rouge during the massacres right after they took over Phnom Penh? Oh, would you say that it was understated? I would say that's pretty accurate. Okay. If you look at Cambodia, okay, they were under under Pon Pot regime, but every province or every town has a different energy to them. So she may be the same age as me, but she may experience what's happening. But for me, it was about collecting sticks and, you know, and working, you know, being an agrarian culture. Okay, so I would say that, you know, mm -hmm. the harshness also might be that too. I don't know. I think she has a lot more family survived than I did. Um, so they might be lenient on some, certain things and they not might not be, it, depending where, where, where you are. Do you follow me, sir? Yes, I do. Okay, because I think just like here, you have different states. Some state may be have different laws than other state and so on and so forth. Um, so oppression, I think, is it was different during the Khmer Rouge, um, and uh, I wish, you know, and and in some aspect, when I talk to other survivor, like oh no, we 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 didn't have a child soldier or anything like that. We can do whatever we want to do, and you know, a little bit freer. But where I was, it was not such the case. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any more questions or yes? Um, do you have children? Yes, I do. And have they heard your story many times? And no, they have not. One, one of my daughters right here. Okay. It's their baby. Um, you know, it is one of those things where I don't, you know, um talk about often just because it is such an emotional, mm -hmm. as you see here, yes. You know, and 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 I encourage them to read what happened in the genocide and begin a conversation by asking me what I went through. You see, most of most of you folks probably have your parents and so on and so forth. And some of the things that you exhibit or do, you might say, Oh, okay, I can look at my parents and know that, okay, that came from my grandfather or that came from my father. For me, I have no idea. I didn't know my parents. So some of the things that I do, I'm just like, I don't understand why I do these things or does that make sense? Like, it's a mystery to me. So I would love a day with my parents to just ask them these questions of, you know, I don't even know if they're like Laos or Vietnamese or Thai or pure Cambodian. I, I don't know. So to me, it's a luxury to, you know, to educate your individual and I hope today my my daughter my son if he's watching will get a different perspective the thing that I do that I do like one of the thing is that education to me is most important okay it's not unique to Cambodian cultures but in Cambodia education has to be paid okay it's not cheap right so I have instilled both the, by my children that you know educate yourself as much as you can because it will free your mind it's as simple as that but thank you for asking that question yes did you speak english when you came to oh no uh, no I, I did not i know two words when i entered the second grade it was either when somebody asked me something or talked to me it's either yes or no <laughs> so you know it, it depending how i felt that day i didn't say yes or no you know um, 
Uh, so yes, two words, that's it. It's a no. <laughs> yes. Do you have nightmares or flashbacks? When I first got here, I did. I, I did have that because it was still fresh in my mind. But as the year progressed, more of the abundance and more of the, you know, the celebration of life and safety and, and security and, and love, that kind of, you know, that kind of went on the side. But I still, you know, me being rescued by the Bartons was so powerful that this is why I went to psychology because I have compassion. I want to give, you know, I want to give myself back to, to the people, educate people. That's why I'm here. Okay. That's why I'm here because I want to give back. Um, but I, I am grateful and thankful that my, my flashback and all that is not as, but I also work it hard to keep that at bay. Okay. Um, I celebrate what happened to me and I don't mean that insult to anybody who's going through the same situation. I am a victor here today, not a victim. Okay. Being this country, being gone through and things, I begin to appreciate light even more. Okay. Because I knew what I went through to get here. Okay. It was not by accident that I'm here. I am here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose. And all of us, we all putting out the same frequency today. Okay. And be connected. I can feel everybody in the room and it is amazing to have that elevation of consciousness. So oh any other question? Yes. We're actually at the end of our time. So we'll take one more question. Sure. Okay, folks. Yes. I actually worked in a refugee camp. With oh, Cambodian. thank you. Thank you so much. And so I know that the UNHCR is the one that got these numbers like these numbers. I yes. almost didn't want to come because this is making me relive. I heard so many stories. Yes. And and you asked about was the book. Um, there were so many in her experiences of what I heard from the record. That it was very true. It was really hard to read it. I, it was, so it's been 40 years, but it's still really hard having heard all these stories second hand. So thank you for sharing it. I know it's um and so the UN organizes the list, and then for almost everybody I knew from the camp I was in that got sponsored was sponsored through uh the Lutheran World Service and yes. Lutheran, the Lutherans, Christian churches, almost everybody was sponsored to the Christian church that I knew, and there was and I knew many, many. Oh, um, it was great. I've kept in touch with quite a few people, and they've all done quite well. And, and, uh, Give some more good. Well, thank I've you so much. Almost all of my Cambodian, but for the first couple of years I was back, I could still speak Cambodian. Oh, well, I went back overseas and learned another language. Oh. Them, so. <laughs> okay, well, I, I feel blessed. Thank, thank you so much, and uh, for honoring our cultures and wanting to help. Well, and Bodhi, I think this is the perfect transition. You've opened up so much meaningful conversation today. I said at the beginning that we were honored to host you, but that is doubly so now that we've heard your story today. So let's give Bodhi one last recognition. 